Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. It's okay to not be okay. And church people need to realize that it's okay to not be okay. And we need to be able to come back to that place where we can be vulnerable with God and say, God, I'm not okay. See, God may not give you the answer to your issue, your problem, your challenge, but let me tell you, let me tell you what God will give you. But God will give you his peace. He'll give you the peace that surpasses all understanding. And you know what? Exactly seven days ago today, we saw something so horrible happen in Las Vegas. 59 people dead, over 500 people injured. And it just seems like the gap keeps getting shorter and shorter in the things that we're seeing. I mean, if you just take 2017, if you guys can put my 2017 slide, look, this is April through uh, October. Look at the gap, April. Mudslides like 200, uh, uh, killed 200 people in, in Colombia. Violent protests erupt in Brazil, resulting in government offices, businesses being shut down for the first time in 21 years. Here's May. ISIS shoots and kills 37 Iraqi refugees and uh, in Syria, injuring over 100 people. Suicide car bombing in Afghanistan kills nine and injures 28. Denver uh, hailstorm was one of the costliest disasters, costing over or causing over $2.1 billion in damages. June, five people are shot and killed in Orlando, Florida before the gunman shoots himself. Forest fires in Portugal kill at least 60 people. Landslide in China buries over 100 people and leaves at least 100 people dead. July, flash flood in Arizona, swimming hole leaves nine dead. 14 wildfires sweep across California, Arizona, New Mexico, Canada, and over 8,000 people are now homeless. Greece experiences massive earthquake, injuring 200 people and killing two. August, Hurricane Harvey hits Texas, leaving thousands of homes destroyed and people homeless. Floods claim 800 lives in India, Nepal, and Bangladesh. Typhoon Haido kills 12 in uh, Macau and southern China. Scientists are perplexed at wildfires as they burn for two weeks straight in Greenland. Now, mind you, Greenland is Iceland, basically. And for two weeks, amongst ice, a fire burns strong. And then you have Charlottesville protests ends in deadly violent riots. September, 8.1 earthquake strikes Oaxaca, Mexico. Superstorm uh, storm Hurricane Irma hits Florida. Category 4 Hurricane Jose touches down in the Caribbean. Nuclear tensions between North Korea rise. Mass shooting in Plano, Texas leaves nine dead. Mexico hit with second earthquake, 7.1. Uh, famine sweeps across <clears throat> India and grows to 90% scarcity of food in Venezuela. And then October, largest mass shooting in U.S. history takes place in Las Vegas, Nevada, leaving 59 dead. And you know what? This week which there's too much news to cover on the news. This week in Mexico, one of the most famous volcanoes erupted this week. What in the world is going on? The gap keeps getting shorter. And I know it's times like this where even Christians are questioning and wondering, where is God in the midst of all this? Where, where is God? Why, why is God allowing all this to happen? And these are real questions that real people have. And we, we have to be the light in the darkest hour. Listen, darkness is getting darker. But what's awesome is when you go into a room that's super dark, if there's even just an inch of light, man, that light will be so much brighter than that darkness. And that's what God wants. He wants the church to be awakened and for us to be the light in this time that we're living in. Because the times we're living in, man, they're very uncertain. I was telling people on Wednesday night, you know what? There are people that are gripped with fear, and they're just constantly just, you know, afraid of, now. I wonder what's going to happen next. Let me tell you something. The day you were born, it was uncertain. And you have to get that revelation. But one thing I do know, one thing I do know, and it's, an, it's something awesome that God said to us, and it's found in Isaiah 43, verse 2 and 3. Look at this. He said, don't be what? Afraid. And that's so, that's so hard to do, but easy to say to someone. Don't be afraid. Uh, on Wednesday night, we had people that were at the Las Vegas uh, shooting uh, during the concert. And, and you know what? It was challenging because uh, a couple was sitting in our church. And, and you know what? 
when the worship started, you would think church is a place where you can just enjoy worship and, and experience God's presence. But to them, let me tell you something, to them, they said, you know what, um, it's, it's hard because we, we heard gunshots and, and people being killed during a time of music. And then our first, our first place that we come to is your church and we're hearing music and all we can do is remember the gunshots. People are gripped with fear, but God comes with a response in these last days, in these end times. And let me tell you something, we are, we are definitely not seeing the last of anything. And that's not to instill fear, it's just to bring some understanding. It's, it's, it's for us to realize that, wait a minute, but God has a bigger plan. Yes, there's an enemy, but let me tell you something. God is much more powerful than anything that the enemy brings upon any person. God is stronger. He says, don't be afraid. I've redeemed you. I've called your name. You're mine. When you're in over your head, I'll be there with you. When you're in rough waters, you will not go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end. Why? Because I'm your God. I'm your personal God. The Holy of Israel, your Savior. I paid a huge price for you, all of Egypt. That's how much you mean to me. That's how much I love you. I'd sell off the whole world to get you back. I'd even trade the creation just for you. That's the kind of love that God has for you and I. And it's times like this where you and I need to be the kind of people that are not instilling fear and saying, oh, my God, man, you better get it right because if you don't, you're going to hell. That's not the message that God wants us to bring. God wants us to bring a message of hope. God wants us to bring a message of love because the last time I read the Bible, it says that love casts out all fear. The love of God will cast out any fear in any home, in any life, and any child. God wants us to be the greatest love vessels for him at this hour as people are hurting, as people are, are, are at this place of just questioning. You know what? At some point, you and I have to draw a line in the sand, and we have to say it. We have to prophesy it out of our mouth and say, you know what, fear? You are not going to win this day any longer because God is with me. Got to draw a line in the sand. Fear will not win the day. Fear will not win the day. Doubt will not win the day. It's not going to win this day. Today, I'm declaring in Jesus' name that God is with me no matter what I face. And maybe some of you, you're facing something right now. When that, that tragedy happened in Las Vegas, it was like one big box, and everybody was just trapped in the box. As, as bullets were just flying, people were in this box. People were trying to jump over gates, etc. Et it was just a box. Now, listen. Maybe you weren't there. Maybe you've never been shot at. But let me tell you something. But I'm sure Satan has taken some shots at you. I'm sure that you are sitting here today by the grace of God and you're still alive. By the grace of God and that you, you have, a, you have a, a, a special gift inside of you and it's called life. And we can't waste this life. We can't just waste life just kind of living without an aim, living just kind of aimlessly. No, we have to live with intention. We have to live knowing that God has a purpose. God has designed me to do something unique and special for him. I can't just sit back and just allow myself to get numb. Who said that this is normal? The world has, now that we're seeing this, get ready. Because you know what's going to happen now? Men's hearts are going to grow cold. You know why? Because it's constant. It's constantly happening. And when something constantly happens, you know what happens to people? They stop feeling. They become numb. And it just becomes normal. Who said that it's okay to be normal? God doesn't want us to be normal. God wants us to stand out and be unique. God wants us to be the church. God wants us to rise. This is the greatest opportunity for you and I to be the church that actually wakes up and rises and says, no, you know what? I'm not just going to sit back and just be numb and, and act like this isn't happening. No, it's happening in our world. And it hit our backyard now, Las Vegas. It hit Elevate Church. One of our faithful volunteers was at the concert when it all went down. And many of us can remember things in our world that took place. For example, if I say 9-11, how many could remember what you were doing at the very hour when, that show, when that, those planes crashed into the Twin Towers? How many remember what you were doing? Look around you. Keep your hands up, please. Look around you. We all remember what we were doing. 
what happens? You know what the enemy likes to do? He likes to put a mark in your life of fear and say, that's what I did. Las Vegas, I can remember, I know exactly what I was doing. You know why? Because our faithful, wonderful volunteer who was there called uh, at, at that hour and said, this is what just happened. This is what just took place. And sure enough, man, I can remember exactly what I was doing when the news of the Las Vegas shooting came on. I know exactly why. It was, it was harsh. It was evil. It was dark. Uh, but, but listen, but more and more, I'm just seeing Christians kind of like, it, it's like, kind of like they care, but they don't care. It, it's almost like, well, well, we can't live like that. That, that needs to change. You, you don't want to get wrapped up and, and, be, and be swayed by the enemy. Look, look at what the scripture says. I'm going to read you another scripture. This is pretty awesome. And we're going to get into some really cool stuff here. Uh, 1 John 5, 19 through 20. Look, look what this says. It says, we know. Everybody say, we know. We know. Uh, in other words, you shouldn't lack knowledge of what's happening in this season. You, you can't. He says, we know that the whole world, the whole world is under the control of the evil one. The whole world is under whose control? The evil one. So, so earth belongs to Satan. Well, that sucks. Why would God let Satan own the world? Let me tell you something. God owns our soul if we're willing to give it to him. But the earth is owned by Satan. Why? Because that is Satan's final burial ground. When this earth is destroyed... Satan goes with it. While we reign for a thousand years, right, with Christ, Satan will be unleashed for a thousand years, but then the end will come for him along with everything in this earth. It's called a thousand year reign. Well, let me tell you something. God is preparing you and I for the greatest glory. God wants to put a mark in your life and, and take the pain that you and I have experienced. And he wants to take your mess and make a beautiful message out of it for us to take this gospel into all the world and bring hope to the hopeless people that we see today. That is our job. And look what he says. He has given us understanding. Oh, verse before that, he says, we also know that the Son of God come. How many know that Christ already came? We, we can all agree to that, right? So it's like, yeah, I know that. I know that. But he says, but now we can know the one who is true. And we belong to the one who is true. So we not only know that he's true, but we belong to the truth. We also belong to his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God. He is eternal life. We have to be careful to not get swifted away with the world system. What do I mean by that? It's, it's amazing how many of us Christians, believers, are, are taken away by so many political nonsense. Now, I get it. We should have a voice, but, but it's, it's no longer having... It's not, it's not even having a voice anymore. It's, it's, it's arguments. It's, it's, it's fighting. It's, you know, I'm right, you're wrong. For example, I love football. How many like football? Love football. Go Patriots. Praise God, right? <laughs> Don't hate. But, uh, but the whole thing with the knee, right? Teams, you know, going against the, 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 um, the patriotic uh, uh, flag symbol, and, and, and everyone's like just taking a knee, like I'm not going to take a knee to that flag. I'm not, I'm not going to have any patriotism. And you know what happens is we get all just, we get taken away by something so stupid, and we start arguing on social media as believers about the knee. Well, let me tell you something. What if, what if you were just to get some conviction back in your life and say, you know what? I'm going to let that situation remind me of when was the last time I actually took a knee for Jesus? While we're arguing about who takes knees, let's get back to the Bible verse that says, and every knee shall bow at the name of Jesus. Well, maybe God is already working on the earth and people are taking knees, and the reality is that every knee will bow and every tongue's going to confess that he's Lord and Savior. And so it's just, come on, don't get, don't get swifted by the, by the drama 
and, 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 and the arguments of people. We live in this world, but we're not of it. But, but so many of us, man, we're just, we're just we're, we're being lullabied to sleep by the spirit of this world. When God gave you the spirit of God himself to bring resurrection life. The Holy Spirit was given so that, so that you would go. He wasn't given just so that you and I can go to church and sing songs. That's not the purpose of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was to resurrect you and give you power to be a witness for Jesus Christ everywhere you go. Everywhere. Everywhere. Look at this. This is awesome. I'm almost done. We're going to get into this. Matthew 24, verse 4 through 8. It says, Jesus answered, keep watch. Everybody say, keep watch. Be careful that no one fools you. Many. Everybody say many. many. Okay, this, this includes you and I, okay, if we're not careful. Many will come in my name. They will claim I am the Christ. Look, that's gonna, that, those are times that are coming. He says they will claim I am the Christ. They will fool many people. You will hear about wars. You will also hear about people talking about future wars. Don't be alarmed. Look at this. So he's saying, hey, listen, this verse isn't to instill fear. This is just to tell you what's up. I'm trying to give you the 411. I'm trying to give you the information. I want you to understand the times that you're living in. But he's saying, but don't be alarmed. And that's, 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 that's kind of interesting. How do you not get alarmed when you're hearing things like 59 people being killed in Las Vegas, but God is saying, hey, listen, don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. He says, you will also hear people talking about future wars. Don't be alarmed. Those things must what? They must what? They must what? They must happen. They must happen. But what do you mean? No, listen. He says, but the end still what? isn't here we're tripping we're like oh my god it's the end of the world no it's not it's not look nation will fight against nation kingdom will fight against kingdom people will go hungry there will be earthquakes in many places all these are the what it's just the beginning of birth pains you know for how many how many moms do i have here that gave birth to children any moms okay ladies you'll understand this do you remember when you had your child? <laughs> Do you remember all the cuss words that came out of your mouth? Do you guys remember that? <laughs> when your husband said, it's all in your head, it really doesn't hurt. I said that. <laughs> My, it's all in your head. It just get power over your thoughts. Like, oh, you don't even want to know what she said. But, <laughs> but the reality is this, is that what we're experiencing on this earth are just contractions of sin. They're just the signs of the times we're living in, but it's not yet. So what is God saying to us? He's saying, hey, listen, church, I'm telling you this uh, not to instill you, but I'm telling you this so that you're not afraid when it comes, so that you're not alarmed by this, but that you actually have an answer for all this and that you can actually bring hope to people and say, hey, listen, um, I know we're experiencing all this, this, this trauma because the last thing you want to do as a person is act like this is not happening. You don't want to deny the fact that this world is in, is in turmoil. You want to be able to say, you know what, you're right. This world is a mess, but there's a God who has a plan for your life. There's a God who loves you. You see, the church, the church better wake up right now. And when I say the church, I mean you. You better wake up. You, you need to wake up. It's not enough anymore just to be a churchgoer. You need to be engaged. You need to lean forward with God. You have to. Why? Because you know what? You and I will be held accountable with what you did with the gift of this life. Your life is a gift. You being alive here today is a gift from God. You having the ability to breathe, it's a gift. God gave you this gift. Today, you get to sit here today, sir, and you get to be here with your wife, uh, and, and you get to enjoy a message because God gave you the gift to wake up today. That is awesome. But some of us have lost the idea. We've lost the revelation that, wow, my life is a gift. It's a, it's a gift that was given by God to me. And what am I doing with this gift? Am I using this gift for God? Or am I despising the gift? Am I despising the fact that God has placed something inside of me that is to bring value to other people? It's a gift. I'm going to go to Revelations now. I know. That's where you can say, uh-oh, Revelations. Look at Revelations chapter 20. I also saw the souls of those whose 
uh, heads had been cut off because they had been uh, they had given witness for Jesus and because of God's word. So check this out. So John, who is the writer of of Revelations, uh, Jesus is allowing him to to see things in the prophetic. He began to see things in in the vision realm, and John is writing what he's seeing in the spirit. And he sees himself going into heaven, and he's, and he's seeing different people who were followers of Jesus Christ, different people who have given their life, who were beheaded. Now, listen, no one here needs to be beheaded. You're all good. You can keep your head. Praise God. Tell your neighbor, keep your head. You're good. Yeah. Don't trip. But, but, check, but, but just stay with me, okay? Please, just don't disconnect. So, so he's walking into heaven. And he's meeting people that were beheaded for Jesus. You were beheaded. You were beheaded. You were beheaded. And he's like looking and he's talking to you for God's word, for the sake of you being a believer that not just knew information, but you lived that information. And so John is like taken back. And it says, and they had not worshipped the beast or his statue. And I know many of us are saying, well, I don't worship the devil. But let me tell you, you don't have to worship the devil to be deceived. You can worship idols and be deceived. You can worship your job and be deceived. You can worship money and be deceived. You can worship your gift, your talent, and be deceived. So it's not, it's not necessarily Satan with a pitchfork and some horns. It's what do you worship? What do you get consumed with? You can worship your pain. You can worship your circumstance where all of a sudden you're looking at your financial problem and you're literally, without even knowing, you're worshiping the problem because you're saying that my problem is bigger than my Savior. That's, that's how the cookie crumbles. And so he says, they had not received his mark on their foreheads or heads. In other words, these were Christians that stood up and they said, hell to the no. No. If nobody's going to lift their hands and sing to God, I will. See, these are the times where you got to stand up and you got to stand out and you got to step up and be God's man or woman. You have to do it. When no one else wants to sing, when no one else wants to worship, when no one else wants to share their faith, I will. That's what they're saying. They're saying they had not received his mark. They had not received anything the enemy threw at at them. They decided we're not going that route. And so many of us, we experience a little some, some, and then we, we become God haters. Like, God, where were you in that situation? No, listen, no matter what the enemy throws at me, I am not going to receive the fact that that is my end. It is not the end for me. It's just the beginning because God is going to use something with this pain. And they came to life, and they ruled with Christ for a thousand years. So let me give you an explanation. This is what it looks like. Just picture this so you get a revelation here. Let's say you got arrested, Maria, for stealing a pack of gum. And listen, you're all thieves. We're all thieves. Everyone here has stolen something at some point, even a pin from your workplace. Sure. Has anyone ever stolen a pin from your workplace? You didn't call it. You call it borrowed. No, you stole it. You, you didn't bring it back. Don't lie. Don't lie. That's theft. So let's just say you stole the pack of gum, you got arrested for shoplifting, right? And you go into prison, you're being checked in, your thumbprint, everything, right? And you come across and you're walking in there like, man. And then you come across some men, right? Some big old dudes. And they're talking about how they murdered X amount of people. And they're talking about their robberies. And, they're, and you're just listening like, dang. And they're talking about all the big stuff they did. And then they look at you like, what are you in here for, man? And you're just like, you, you don't, you're, you're embarrassed to say what you're in for. Like, how do you even get in the game with people that are murderers and robbers and you're, you're a gum stealer? I mean, at least say that you're a gum pusher or something. I don't know. But, like, you got to come up with something. This is what this verse is saying. What are you going to say as a Christian when you get to heaven and you're around men like this? who were beheaded for the gospel of Jesus Christ, men and women who were willing to live out for Jesus, completely, radically, bold, unashamed, unafraid, no longer wondering whether or not they have a true identity in Christ. What are you going to say to those people? Oh, yeah, I went to church on Sunday and I sang songs. You don't do that with people that were beheaded. That will be embarrassing. What am I saying? We need to come to the place where just going to church is not enough. You have to live the word out. You got to live it. 
You got to live it. Church is where you're equipped. Then you got to do something. Why? Because when we get to heaven, you're going to hear people's testimonies. You're going to hear people's stories. What did you do? Dude, I, I, led my whole, I led my whole staff to Jesus. I left my coworkers. I left half my coworkers to Christ. Those are the stories you want to you wanna, you wanna, uh, talk about. Those are the experiences you want to give. And so this, this is time for us to, to take it serious and, and realize that, that God wants to rule and reign in your life and that it's no longer okay just to kind of be numb. And, and you're just kind of living with the, the motion of life and just kind of like go to work, have dinner, have some entertainment, and then you do it all over again the next day. And there's where, where, where is the mark of Jesus in your life? Where? Where is there a story of, of Jesus in your life? Are you with me? Um, last week, we had an amazing uh, person uh, in our church who was at the shooting. And, uh, and I read a verse in Genesis chapter 50, which I'm going to show you on the screens right now. He says, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people lives or save people alive. I know that every single person here has experienced some form of pain. Everyone has. And, and trust me, I, if you say, no, I've never had anything painful happen, trust me, you have. All of us have experienced pain. If someone offended you, that's painful. If someone hurt you, if someone talked about you, that's painful. But there are people here that have experienced um, you know, sexual abuse or you've experienced uh, uh, deaths in your family. Maybe you lost a child. It's something that was just so painful. But the problem is that that, that pain has kept some believers, some people paralyzed. And, and, and then they just become so consumed with their pain that they can't move forward anymore. And you live the rest of your life with this pain and, and you're wasting life. Instead of experiencing the amazing miracles that God wants to do in your life. And so Danette, who is someone that, uh, that we truly love and we care about, uh, was at the shooting. And, uh, and I remember her calling uh, my phone. I, I didn't answer for, for uh, whatever reason. I was doing something. And I don't know. I didn't even know the number. It was just like a number. And normally I don't answer phone calls that just has a very basic number that I, I, have, I just don't answer. And I heard the voicemail, and I can hear the pain in her voice as she's telling me what just took place, as she is there at that moment. And so uh, I, uh, I, I called Annette, and we prayed right there in the spot on the phone while you were in Vegas, and, uh, and she began to share with me her account. But I, I want to talk, talk with the people through your story, because your pain has now become a message for people that have, have been traumatized maybe by something that they experience in life. Some are even paralyzed. Now, I know that you're paralyzed, and we're sensitive about that. You know, I'm always sensitive with you. But there are people that literally have not been able to move anymore. Mm -hmm. Danette, you were, you were living the life. You're, you have, you're a business owner of your own business. You're an amazing, successful woman. You're a great single mom. Oh, my God, you're amazing. Your son, Daniel, is just ridiculous. Her son, her youth, is the one who brought, brought her to church. Uh, Danette was a church hater. She was a God hater. And to see her life the way she is now, it's just like, wow, very profound. But just share with us what, what, what happened. What, how did your day start? Because I think so many of us just talk about the pain. But, but you had, before that pain, everything was mm -hmm. awesome, wonderful. Just oh, share yeah. with us. My sister and I, we had planned this trip for a year. We bought the tickets a year ago. And we were so excited. It would be my first country music um, festival. So this is like a three-day event. It's just not a concert. I mean, you're there most of the day listening to different artists, and we couldn't have been more excited, and we got somebody to cover us after opening the store, which was great because we didn't even know if we'd be able to go. Um, and my dad got us on this, you know, semi-private jet. I mean, we were going to do it right. Like, we were so excited. And we had spent two days there already, and it was awesome. And then the third night, uh, Jason Aldean was closing out the show, and so it was packed. Um, there was about 30,000 there. Yeah, I mean, packed. Everybody was standing at this point. He was performing. He was on his third song, and we heard the first five shots. And I knew immediately that it was bad. So I, I gave my sister that kind of look, you know, 
and she she brushed it off and oh stop it Danette you know because I'm that person who's gonna worry and then there was a pause and then we got about there was five more shots and Jason Aldean uh, kind of you know you could tell he was unsure he kind of was singing but he wasn't he wasn't sure and then at that point that was when just an unbelievable amount of just rapid fire bullet after bullet started going he ran off the stage somebody turned off the lights so everybody knew it it was something horrific and so people started yelling uh, get down get down so my sister gets down on the floor I just got down like this like that was my first thought you know and um, she's she's becoming she was becoming distraught you know she she started to dial on on the phone her phone was on the floor and she's dialing our dad's phone number and she's sobbing and she's saying dad dad they're shooting us they're shooting us um, I don't know what to do with Danette I don't know what to do and it was that moment that this just unbelievable amount of calmness came over me and peace and I I knew that it, that was not me that was the Lord and I knew it because I'm not a calm and cool you know person I you got a problem give it to me I'm gonna worry for you like, I'm professional, okay? <laughs> a professional warrior. I yes. Love it. Not a warrior, but a warrior. <laughs> yes. So, um, you know, I just, I, I felt that calmness. And as she was crying into the phone, um, I, I was still bent over and I said, everything's going to be okay. Everything is going to be okay because the Lord is with us. And I just knew that. I knew it. I could feel him. And uh, it was very chaotic. I mean, people were ru trying to run out. We had bought tickets in a special section, so we were in a VIP. We were we were lifted up f to the side of the stage. And um, it, it was just chaotic. And so I, I repeated that to my sister. She eventually pulled me out of the wheelchair onto the ground. And so we're both on the ground and we managed to get under this, I managed to get under these bleachers. And when you're in this kind of situation and it's, it's I mean, the firing was nonstop. It, it was just, I mean, hundreds and hundreds. And as I got under, the bench you know you're, you're realizing I mean I had what I knew was was real I was really two different worlds I have God who's with me and I know this to be so true and then I have the reality of what I'm living which is somebody is trying to kill me and everybody around me so you, you're battling these two it's it's a very difficult moment you know but you you know you feel God with you I he never left me but there was moment when the reality did start to hit me and I felt like I you know I was vulnerable I my back was not covered I was almost in the aisle way and I remember yelling out like I need somebody to cover me like let's pull the chair down pull the chairs down because they were folded up and then this man, he, he grabbed my hand. He was underneath the bleachers with me. And he grabbed my hand and he said, we're okay, we're okay. And I looked at him and I said, yes, we are, because God is with us. And he said, yes, he is. And even in the, in the breaks of shooting, you know, people would run out. I mean, people were crawling past me and I thought, well, I can crawl, you know? But I knew to just stay where I was. And you see, God, in that moment, I, I can't, I don't have the physical ability to run or to get up and rescue somebody like somebody had rescued, ends up ended up rescuing me. I don't have that. But I realized in that moment that God had given me a different gift. He gave me an inner strength that I could share with whoever I was with at that moment. 
and I don't know if it gave them peace, and it was just my sister and that man, but I knew that I was supposed to declare his name in that chaos. I was supposed to declare that he was with us. And I just, it's still hard to like revisit it all, you know? But I, before we left, you know, before we went on this trip, I had told the girls on the First Impressions team this verse from Hebrews uh, chapter 10. And it says that we have to hold on to our confession of hope without wavering because he he who promised he's faithful and he was faithful to me in that moment and I know that I could never waver like everything that I've ever doubted or ever wondered about even here at Elevate you know, what, what can I do here? Can I really give, you know, more to make this place better? Oh, can I, can I, am I an important part of the prayer team? Should I be doing this? Like any of those questions, we can't do that. We can't doubt. We just have to know what is true. And what is true is the Lord and what he tells us through his word. We have to know that. We have to hold on to it. I, I love, I love the fact that that you're a word woman now, because you went, you went extreme. And you know what? Some of you, you're, you're probably, um, you know, you love God. I'm sure many of you love God. All of you probably love God. But how many know that loving God is the is the beginning? It's, it's the, it's the. It's the initial part of, of starting this walk with God. That's wonderful that you love God because you know he loved you first. But then there's something different when you go from loving God to now living for God. And, uh, and, and, and I know that you're here every week. You volunteer in our, volunteer, in our greeter ministry, and you're always smiling. But one week before um, you leave, you're encouraging the women in our ministry, and you're telling them, hey, listen, here's a verse I want you to want you guys to remember is that is that let's not waver in the hope that was given to us because he who promises faithful and not realizing that that word was actually the word that was going to get you through your storm and not and not wavering in the midst of of knowing what's really happening and and I think that's most of our battles I think all of us here can just be honest that the struggle is real and the struggle is always the truth of God versus the reality of what we're experiencing because our reality is much more real than the truth that we hear from God, right? Because this is, hearing God is, 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 is trying to interpret his word by faith and really accepting the fact that that word is for me. I'm not going to waver because God is with me. But the reality sets in because now I'm in the storm. Right. And, and it's that struggle. And I know there's people here that are probably living more in their reality than they're living more for the truth. And God wants to bring us from our reality into his truth because his truth will always trump any reality you're facing. And I know that Danette being paralyzed, um, I love what she said. She said, and, and it touched me yesterday, like impacted my soul. She said, you know what, Pastor? I don't have the gift of running and I didn't have the gift to carry people. But the gift that I did have, I used and I had the gift of bringing peace to people. And so many of us, we're paralyzed in a different way in life. You're paralyzed with fear. You're paralyzed with doubt. Maybe you're paralyzed with unbelief. Maybe you're paralyzed with just being shell-shocked by the, the, the issues you're dealing with in family or your children. Uh, or, or maybe you're just, you've been, you've been wavering in your walk with God because the enemy has done a number on you and, and has put you to sleep and now you're just numb. Or maybe you're someone that has grown cold in heart because of the constant experiences that you're going through. Listen, a person is not responsible for your heart being well. God is. And so many times you're waiting for people to get it right with you, when in reality, you need to get it right with God. And then God will heal your heart. And God wants to use your pain 
and he wants to use that pain and he wants to allow it to be a message. Danette's pain now is her message because what she experienced is real. That was a reality. But God's truth has become now something that she gets to share in how God was with her. You know what I'm saying? It's like the first verse I started reading, reading in Isaiah when he said, but I'm with you. See, maybe right now you feel like you're, you're, you're between a rock and a hard place. But God says, but it's not your end. And I don't know where you're at, but God wants to do something inside of you. God wants you to be free from fear, free from doubt. God doesn't want you to be afraid of the times that we're living in. God wants you to have faith in him that he is with you. He's for you. I believe that, that this is your hour to really reflect and say, you know what? I'm going to stop allowing my doubts. And I love the fact that you said doubt at some point. Because you've doubted, should I be on this prayer team? Should I be praying for people? And that's what happens to most Christians. They're constantly doubting the fact that God put a gift inside of you. And God wants to use that gift. So please stand to your feet. If today's message impacted you in any way, and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.